Of all the elements that make up a city, none is more important than the street. Streets are a city's veins, its arteries, they form its entire circulation system. They are where we want to be and they are how we get there. They also form the biggest part of the public realm. And now, more than ever, streets are under siege. Across North America, Europe, and in fact around the world, calls are growing louder and louder for streets to be opened up to everyone. For almost a century, we've been told that streets belong to cars and trucks. Nobody else is allowed on them. That's all starting to change, mostly because cyclists and pedestrians want access to the streets of the city. This pressure is changing the face of cities everywhere nowhere more so than here in Toronto. A cyclist is hit every six hours of every day of the year. Okay. Um, you know, a pedestrian, for that matter, is hit every three hours of every day of, of the year. I know that we'll see an increase in the number of, uh, of bikes on the road. You have you have 250 people in a streetcar that are stuck behind one car turning left, and that's where the congestion is. You know, there's some bike riders and drivers who don't know the, the rules of the road and what they're supposed to do, and then they get angry at each other, and it further sort of divides us, and we don't need to be doing that. I'm here today with Cherise Berta. She's the executive director of the Ryerson University City Building Institute. She's been studying cities for a long, long time, so we wanted to have a chat with her. Cherise, thank you for coming this morning. We're interested in streets, and the argument is that streets in the 21st century are under siege. They are hotly contested spaces. People want access to them in a way that they haven't had before, and I want you to tell me whether you've noticed that. Yeah, I think we are actually at a point, we're at a turning point. And I think that we're seeing now more than ever this desire for cities to um, take back streets for people. And I think it's a convergence of a lot of things, that uh, our population is moving back into the cities. You know, 80% of Canadians live in urban areas. And so we are vying for a type of livability. We're trying to create community and urban villages, and it's difficult to do that when most of the space is dedicated to vehicles. If you ask a hundred Torontonians what's their favorite street in the city, 70, maybe even 80 would tell you it's this, Collard Street, specifically the stretch between, let's say, Bathurst and Ossington, Little Italy as it's known. And it's not hard to understand why. Not because the architecture is so great, not because it's so elegant, because it really isn't. The traffic is slow enough that people on bikes feel comfortable using this portion of Collard Street. That's an important fact. Then you have the sidewalks, which are a little wider than usual, which means that there's lots of room for pedestrians, outdoor cafes, and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got the buildings, most of them three, maybe four stories tall. They're narrow buildings, maybe four, five, six meters wide. So every few steps, there's something new to engage you. Restaurants, bars, hardware stores, grocery stores, it's all here, and it's all within easy walking distance. And if you look carefully at the buildings, you'll notice that most of them were built in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In other words, they were constructed before the car. Now that would all change after World War II, and at the time, not many people thought about it. But the impact on the city was profound. This is what happens when we build cities for cars instead of people. Welcome to Whitby. This is the north end of the city, east of Toronto. And as you can see, the road here has been reduced to nothing more than a thoroughfare, a vehicular thoroughfare, a way to get from A to B. There are no bicycle lanes here. They would be incredibly dangerous. There are no pedestrians here, even though there is a sidewalk, which is kind of unusual for this part of town. Where does the activity happen? Well, it's either at home in a subdivision over here or over here, or in the mall over there the Walmart, the LCBO, all those kinds of things, surrounded by parking for thousands and thousands of cars. 
It's a degraded and rather bleak landscape. And oh, by the way, there is a bike rack in front of the Walmart. Of course, it's empty. To show you what I mean, we've come to a subdivision just down the road from the Walmart. And as you can see, there's not a whole lot of pedestrians on these streets. In any direction you look, they're empty. And there are no cyclists either. And in fact, each house here looks like a life support system for a pair of cars. This is what happens when we design our cities for automobiles instead of people. Even here in the degraded landscape that exists at the very edge of suburban sprawl, the road is the first thing to appear. And it's not just so that they can bring in heavy equipment to do the building and so that people can drive home. It's the road system that allows us to make sense of the terrain. It allows us to organize the topography into units that we can understand. Without it, there is only chaos. There is only wilderness. But not all suburbs are created equal. This is Markham, one of the few communities in Ontario that has embraced the 21st century ideal of the new city. Markham has gone through the usual suburban evolution. And now you've got behind me the new Markham downtown. It's not finished yet. It's very much a work in progress. But the intention here is to build a new type of suburb, one based on density, compactness, and less of a reliance on the car. That means narrower streets, animated on both sides, all kinds of mixed use, people living here, people working here, people going to the theater, going to restaurants, all that kind of thing, and doing those things on their own two feet rather than driving. Now, it's still a work in progress. It has a long way to go, but I think that there are reasons for optimism. It's kind of sterile and monotonous, but there's something actually very interesting happening here. What we've got is suburban row housing. Now that would normally be a contradiction in terms. Suburbs are all about open spaces, lots of room to do everything, to spread out. Row housing is about being compact, tightly put together, all that sort of stuff. But this is the new model right here. This is where it's happening. This is the future of the suburbs. And you know, the province is putting all kinds of pressure on small towns to build more densely. This is the result. It's not pretty, but it's probably a lot more sustainable than what we've been building for the last 60 years. You do have to wonder about what's going on exactly out here in the new Markham downtown. On the one hand, they want the full convenience of car culture. I mean, keep in mind, we're sitting on top of an underground parking garage, but at the same time, they want all the benefits, all the enjoyment of an urban downtown culture. The desire to have both car culture and an urban lifestyle is entirely understandable, and maybe they'll be able to pull it off out here in Markham. But one thing is for certain, it could not be done in downtown Toronto, and I'll show you why. Here in the downtown core, where we're sitting right now at Ryerson University, is part of the core, which is going to double in population over the next decade or so. If you think about that, of putting, you know, adding all that, those people, adding all that employment to the downtown core, can we add that many? Can we add double the cars and trucks to the roads? We really can't. There's no space for it. You can't build more roads in the downtown core. What you can do is create opportunities for other types of mobility, and that's the way we have to go in the future, or we're just going to be jammed. Roads are built for buses, cars, and trucks, not for people on bikes. And, you know, I feel my heart bleeds for them when I hear someone gets killed, but it's their own fault at the end of the day. And there's this fear, uh, and I don't know what it's a fear of. Like this war on the car business yeah. is either the car or the bike, the car or the pedestrian. There's, there's a resistance to the idea that the, sh the streets can be shared by all different forms of mobility. Yeah, I, I, and I, I, I tend to agree that I, I think Torontonians are there. Torontonians, you know, who are out there, who are, you know, riding, who are walking, who are driving, who are taking public transit, they get it. They get the issue. They want to see an investment in you know, really high quality cycling infrastructure. When asked about whether they would ride more often if the streets were safer, again, two thirds say yes, I want to ride. I want to actually be able to get to, you know, home, to school, to play, buy bicycle. Um, but they're not doing it because our streets are not safe enough. 
That being said, you know, you got to ask the question, well, what's going on at City Hall? That's a great question. What is going on at City Hall? Well, we've come down here to find out. I just want to point out that we asked the mayor, John Tory, and chief planner, Jennifer Kiesmat, to appear. Neither was available. Anyway, we're going to speak now to downtown councillor Mike Layton. He's led the charge to open up the streets of Toronto to bicycles and pedestrians. Here's what he has to say. Well, you know what? I think as our city grows, uh, I think I think we're starting to see more pressure on our existing infrastructure. And as uh, as that debate folds out, there are those in our city that want to want want people to pick a side. Um, sadly, it's it's actually not the case for most of us. Well, I, I bike most days, but I'm a I'm a transit rider other days, and I'm a driver on occasion. And so it it's more about figuring out how how what is that balancing act of making sure the streets are good for pub, for public safety, good for people getting around. Um, as well as a vibrant, uh, uh, building a vibrant city. Sometimes those streets need to close down for every, to everyone um, so that we can have another use. The fact that it took council over a week to deliberate over a pilot project for a temporary bike lane on Bloor really shows you that we, um, we aren't quite ready as an entire city with the, the core and the suburbs to make these decisions. So we need these pilots to actually prove that once you put these things in place, cars don't shop, people shop. Over the last 30 or 40 years, there's a reason why we didn't get bike lanes on Bloor when people were asking 40 years ago. There wasn't as many cyclists on the road, it wasn't as large a mode share for people on a daily basis, and there wasn't as much, much acceptance. Fast forward 40 years, and now you've got the business improvement areas willing to put money in to study how much, uh, how, how much benefit it's bringing to their, to their businesses. For example, you look at where we are right now at Young and Dundas, right downtown in the core, it's amazing. Only 13% of people come to this, arrive to this area by, by, by automobile. And it just shows you in a place in the downtown core where everybody wants to be, um, you, you come here at rush hour and the sidewalks are overflowing with people. We can't wrap our heads around how it could be, what it could look like. People don't can't imagine a different reality. So when you suggest taking space away from cars, the reaction is, oh no, I'm, it's, there's going to be less space for me. There's going to be more congestion on the road. It's going to make my commute worse. Rather than looking at the flip side, oh wow, there's going to be all these opportunities for more people. Maybe it's not the driver, maybe it's not me, but other people are going to use the sidewalks and they're going to use the bike lanes and they're going to use the transit and then there's actually more room for me. People need to start looking at it that way because it's a huge percentage of the population that want to get to work faster and they want to do that in other ways other than having to drive. It's the model of how people shop is, is, is changing. Um, there, there's less driving out to the mall, out to the big box store, getting everything all at once. Uh, for, for many of us that live in, in, in communities that are walkable neighborhoods that have the amenity of a butcher shop, a bakery, a local, uh, a local fruit and vegetable produce uh, stand. We want to go to those because they're closer to our homes. We don't have to jump in the car, drive to a, a, a giant parking lot, and then and then fight through a long cashier's line. We prefer to have that uh, that amenity closer. Now, you're a young person. I, I'd like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Um, some people have argued that this is a generational thing that. Once my generation is out of the way, once it's been pushed aside, that the, the, the millennials uh, will take over and that they're the ones who, uh, as much as anyone, want to be downtown living in the condos. They're the ones who want to walk to work, ride a bike to work. Is, is that your experience? I don't think it's just, gen just generational. I think that uh, uh, there, there's also a, a, a bit of a geographical change. It depends on, on people's habits. Diana, I, I want you to tell us a story. You, you started in Thornhill, you drove everywhere you went, and then a couple of years ago you moved downtown and the car suddenly disappeared. What, what happened? Um, well, I had the car for about a year when I first moved downtown, and I noticed I wasn't using it often, and I was paying for a car and using Uber, Transit, and Car2Go, actually. So that's, that's the car service where you can rent by the hour practically. Rent by the minute. By the minute. So you can take the car, drive to your destination,
drop off the car anywhere in the lots that are there and then um, you just leave it there so you can go out drinking and whatnot, not have to worry about getting your car, paying for parking or anything like that. So in other words, you didn't need a car. You, you discovered that you didn't need a car to live in the city. Yeah. And I live more of an active lifestyle because of that too. Like in the summertime, I bike to work. I became totally immersed in the downtown lifestyle or East End lifestyle more so because it's, I think people down here are more active. You know, everyone's exercising every day or doing activities and uh, it's engaging and I love it. Because this is where the lifestyle is. This is where the, yeah, the, the things are. Yeah, these are where my friends are now. This is where I want to be or I want to hang out. And I wanted to live near the beach. Uh -huh. You know, 54% of Torontonians in the last year have ridden a bicycle. That's 1.4 million people. And they're doing it in a variety of ways. And I think that's where the city's going, is we're becoming more and more multimodal. People are going to drive a car maybe for a long distance trip. You know, they'll take transit, they'll walk, they'll ride their bicycle. Um, but people do need options to be able to do that. They're going to leave the bike at home if they don't feel safe. And if you have any doubts about how popular the bicycle has become as a means of transportation, we brought you here to Spadina, just a bit north of Queen. And as you can see, there are hundreds and hundreds of bicycles parked in this small two block stretch. I'm standing in what was a lay-by parking for two cars. Now, in this area alone, there are more than 30 bikes. There are bikes in front of me, bikes behind me, bikes everywhere. And if you don't believe me, listen to Yvonne Bambrick. She literally wrote the book on cycling. Her bestseller, The Urban Cycling Survival Guide, has sold thousands of copies since it came out a couple of years ago. I get the impression uh, from what I read and what I see around that there is uh, in this city and in other cities around the world a great hunger for the bicycle and for the ability to ride a bike around a city. Absolutely, and it's growing. I mean, there's also, you know, our, our populations are increasing. We don't have a lot more room for more cars. Cars have been the source of congestion uh, for years, and I think our love affair with the automobile has grown a little stale. We're, we're recognizing the value of active lifestyles, you know, active living, um, and recognizing the, the value of a predictable travel time. The bicycle offers predictable travel times. Once you know your route, uh, you don't get stuck in traffic. You go past it. And I think people really value that uh, in terms of efficiency. And, and just to get back to the issue of safety, I mean, we've been talking about the Scandinavian countries where they ride bikes. Uh, I mean, they, they, they ride bikes as if, um, it's the most natural thing in the world. They're not dressed in helmets and elbow pads and, and you know, uh, horns and this and that. Um, yet here, we think of it as a very dangerous uh, thing. When will we, will we ever achieve that sort of equivalent condition here in Toronto where you can just hop on your bike, ride to work, and not think twice about whether I'm going to get make it back in one piece or not? Are we, are we going to get achieve that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, my sense is, is that at the end of the day, you know, when we're talking about people who are riding bicycles in Copenhagen or, you know, in Amsterdam or in other places, we're talking about people who ride bicycles. We're not talking about cyclists. This is not an identity issue. This is just a way that people just get around. Good point. Uh, and increasingly, I think we're going to see that more and more in the city of Toronto. You know, we, we all need to be doing better when it comes to sharing the road, and that's another key component of why bike lanes and bike infrastructure is so important, is that it gives everyone their space. So you've got the, you know, the infrastructure itself, that goes down great, but then what are we doing to teach people how to use it? We don't do any public education when it comes, you know, public service announcements, marketing campaigns about how to share the road, what your responsibilities are depending on your mode. We don't do that. I've been harping on that for years. So what, people and should take a course in how to no, ride a bike? Or? Well, I mean, hey, I wrote a book. This is a useful tool and I wrote this because there's so many new people riding, but we didn't teach kids how to ride in traffic as part of, of their school curriculum like they do in places like Copenhagen. So I wanted to give people a, a starting point for those that have thought, you know, I want to get back on my bike. That actually looks like something I can do, but where do I start? What kind of bike do I need? What am I supposed to do to turn left? What, you know, what are the expectations? What are my rights, responsibilities? I tried to put everything you need in this book, but that said, what I mean by public education is public service announcements. And 
when, when I did my license, there was nothing in there about sharing the road with bicycles. So we, ha we are not educating people for this new way of road sharing and the, and the new realities of an urban center and how people are using the roadways. So it's, it's fairly easy to put together a great commercial that explains, hey, that's, you know, that person over there, that person took their bike today instead of their car. And here's what you're supposed to do when you both get to the intersection at the same time. Or even, um, you know, language barrier free visual signage in bus shelters, for example, about using your right hand to open your door when you get out of the driver's side. That forces you to shoulder check and you're going to look to see if there's a bike coming. So we can do simple stuff like that, but I think some of the funds that we put towards infrastructure and on-street stuff, we've got to almost match those funds when it comes to teaching people how to use it. How much does it cost to put in bike parking like we see across the road here or paint a, a, a some well, lines it, on it the road? It depends on the type of infrastructure for sure. I'm not sure what the cost of these racks was for the city. Uh, you'd have to double check with transportation about about the cost of uh, per kilometer of the different stuff, like, uh, like what we've got on uh, Richmond. So the cycle track versus the painted line. Either way, pennies compared to the one point something billion we're talking about for moving a slice of the gardener over, well, yeah. right? Priorities. The fact that we can spend a billion dollars and reconstruct the Gardner Expressway East, in light of climate change, in light of so many things. The fact that we're going to be doubling the population in the downtown core. Why in the world would we create a, a, a chunk of expressway to, to service um, a, a fraction of vehicles that are coming from outside of the downtown core when we really need to be creating more places for the downtown core, for people to live and work sustainably? It also, you know, completely flies in the face of what other cities are doing around the world. Um, they're taking down their expressways. It's, it's unbelievable that we're thinking about, you know, committing ourselves to you know, last century's technology and last century's mobility. Look at what we could do with the money that's now, well, maybe is to be earmarked for the gardener. Think of what we could do across our city. I mean, we could, we, could, we could have a connected network of bike lanes in the inner and outer suburbs as well as the core for even a, a fraction of the money that's, that's proposed for the gardener. Maybe this is what they had in mind up in Markham, and it's not hard to see why. I'm at Toronto's new waterfront downtown, standing in front of Queen's Quay, which until fairly recently was a four-lane unofficial highway that ran along the bottom end of the city. Now, under the direction of Waterfront Toronto, it has become one of the city's first complete streets. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look. you still got the lanes for cars, but you also have streetcars, you have bicycle lanes, serious bicycle lanes, and you have these enormous wide sidewalks. And as you can see from all the activity going on around me, people love it. This is what happens when you build a street where everyone is welcome. Everyone wants to be here. It seems everyone is here. More and more where people want to work, where people want to play, is in vibrant municipal spaces, are in, are in good global cities. And those cities have something else to offer just, just in roads and, 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 and buildings. They've got a life, they've got a pulse. And, and a lot of that has to do with what is activated on, on the roads and on the sidewalks beside them. It's a complicated problem and it's, it can't be something that is just limited to you know, redesigning roadways, though that's a really important part. We have an example of transit which is overused on King Street and you don't solve that congestion by just making bigger vehicles. It's not about hating cars, it's no. about rethinking how we use our city space. This is public transportation space and we have to consider how people are moving, how they want yeah. to move, how they could be Being move. more equal in, 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 in how we it's share the spaces. It's and it's tough. So, we've talked to a lot of people, and even though they don't agree on everything, certain points do seem to emerge. For example, congestion. Congestion has reached the point where it can no longer be ignored, either on the streets of Toronto or the province. Then there's the question of safety. People are being killed in record numbers on the roads and highways of Ontario. This has to be dealt with. 
There is an urban revolution unfolding now and people want access to the streets of the cities in this province. That doesn't mean suburbia is dying or that it's dead, far from it. But even out there, there's a hunger now for walkable spaces and dense communities where people can get where they want to get without having to drive for half an hour. We saw that in Markham and it's going to happen in other suburban communities as well. The people who live in the condos that you see behind me don't want to own cars. We talked to Diana Lee. She arrived in Toronto a couple of years ago, discovered pretty quickly that she didn't need a car and doesn't even want a car. She can get where she wants to get by bike. These changes are not going to happen easily. They're not going to come quickly. There's enormous opposition. The idea that the streets belong to cars and trucks is ingrained and has been for 60, 70, 80 years. The very mayor of this city, John Tory, has done everything he can to slow down this change, this opening up of the streets. But the urban revolution has started, and although it's not finished yet, it's well along the way. For the Star.com, I'm Christopher Hume. What do you think? <laughs>